You are listening to the Adult Sabbath School Lessons for the third quarter of 2022. This is lesson number one of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide in the Crucible with Christ. This lesson is titled The Shepherd's Crucible and is ready for teaching on July 2. The author is Pastor Gavin Anthony, who was conference president in Iceland when he wrote this series of lessons. Today, your lesson is read by Dr. Percy Harold. But first, the introduction to this series of lessons, read by the author himself, Pastor Gavin Anthony. The Crucified Creator. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. John 1.3 All things were made by him, Jesus, and yet according to scripture, Jesus wept. The creator wept. Even more so, Jesus was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The creator, a man of sorrows, despised and rejected? And he once cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How could these things be? It's because Jesus, our Creator, also was our Redeemer. And as such, he was the crucified God, the Creator who took on humanity, and in that humanity suffered through a life of privation and toil that ended with him hung on a Roman cross. Thus our Creator, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, suffered in humanity in ways that none of us ever could. We can experience only our own griefs, our own sorrows. At the cross, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, all of them. It's the most amazing act in all cosmic history. With that background, that of a crucified God lifted up for us, we will, for the next few months, seek to better comprehend the incomprehensible, our own suffering, the suffering of Christians, of those who have committed their lives to Christ. We make no claims to have all the answers, or even many. We're claiming only that God is love. And that although these things happen, we can trust God despite them and, indeed, grow in grace through them, no matter how painful the process. This quarter we will study the Word of God and see how other flesh and blood, though radiated in faith, nevertheless faced despair, betrayal, disappointment, loss, injustice and abuse. Sound like anything you can relate to? How did they cope? What did they learn? How can their examples teach us? As we look at these people, their experiences, their struggles and their trials of faith, which might be much like our own, we must always see them contrasted against the background of the cross. We must always remember that no matter what anyone faces, Jesus Christ, our Creator and Redeemer, went through worse. Our God is a suffering God. Even Albert Camus, hardly a Christian, understood some of the implications of the cross and the sufferings of God there. He wrote, The night on Golgotha is so important in the history of man, only because, in its shadow, the divinity abandoned its traditional privileges and drank to the last drop. Despair included the agony of death. Or as Ellen White expressed it, the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that, from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. Our lessons are not a theodicy, the justification of God in the face of evil. Instead, as we've said, they're an attempt to help us work through the inevitable suffering we all face here in a world in which sinning is as easy as breathing. What we will try to show is that pain, suffering and loss don't mean that God has abandoned us. They mean only that as believers we now share in the common lot of a fallen race. The difference is that through Jesus and the hope he offers us, we can find meaning and purpose in what seems meaningless and purposeless, and that somehow, even if we can't imagine how, we can trust the promise that all things work together for good to those who love God. The God who, though he made all things, suffered all things too. And that's why we love him. My name is Gavin Anthony, and I'm this quarter's principal contributor. I grew up in Sri Lanka as a missionary kid and worked as a pastor in England before becoming conference president in Iceland, where I authored these lessons. Sabbath afternoon, June 25. 
Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, as we come opening your word again and looking at the life of Jesus over this next quarter, we pray that not only will we see his life and see the stories and see the teachings, but that we may actually have Jesus as our friend and our Saviour. We pray today for people all over the world, whether they be in Kuwait, uh, in the Middle East, whether they be in Wellington, New Zealand, or Katoomba in Australia, or Anchorage in Alaska, or Lima in Peru, or Lusaka in Zambia, or Oslo in Norway, or Quezon City in the Philippines, or Nandi in Fiji. Wherever we're listening today, Lord, we pray for your blessing and your guidance. May your Spirit show us what we need to learn from this lesson. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 23 and verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's read that again. Psalm 23 and verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sophie leaned back against her bedroom door and slid to the floor. Tears were welling up fast, and it was only a moment before she was sobbing. How could he? How could he? Sophie had just received news that was breaking her heart. Someone she thought was a friend, someone she respected and trusted, was spreading awful gossip about her in order to ruin her reputation and the work she had been doing. Grabbing her Bible off the bed, she suddenly found herself staring at some very familiar words. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Surely this can't be, she blurted out to herself but the logic seemed inescapable. The shepherd in the psalm was guiding his sheep in paths of righteousness, but these very paths also seemed to wind their way into the valley of the shadow of death. Could it be possible that even this painful betrayal by a friend, this dark valley, could be used by God to train her in righteousness? And now for the week at a glance. At what times have you grown more spiritually? Through the easy times or the harder times? Sunday, June 26. A guide for the journey, the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, we read in Psalm 23, verse 1. Some children were asked to draw a picture of God. Without exception, each one drew a picture with a heart somewhere in it. When asked why, they declared unanimously that God is love. It was as simple as that. It is easy to have a good opinion of God and His purposes when everything is going well. But as we grow older and life becomes harder and more complicated, our view of God often changes. God doesn't change, of course, but we do. As we read in Hebrews 13 verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and James one seventeen, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Because of the pastoral lifestyle of the people in Old Testament times, Psalm 23 uses the image of a shepherd to describe the way God cares for us. The symbol of a shepherd is used for God in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's a wonderful picture and one that is changeless too. Before we look at Psalm 23, let's survey how different Bible writers understand the work and character of the shepherd throughout the Bible. What do you learn about the shepherd from each of these texts? Isaiah 40 and verse 11 He will feed his flock like a shepherd. 
He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. And Jeremiah 23 verses 3 and 4 But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. And Ezekiel 34 verse 12. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day, he is among his scattered sheep. So will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And John 10, verses 14 to 16, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. And First Peter chapter 2, verse 25, For... You were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now turn to Psalm 23. What does the shepherd do to care for his sheep? Well, verse 2, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Verse 3, he restores my soul, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. And verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so to finish today, what does it mean to you to know that there is someone like this caring for you? How could you use this picture to encourage someone whose picture of God has been obscured because of his or her own struggles, whatever they are? Monday, June 27. Locations on the journey. Psalm 23, verse 3 in the New Revised Standard Version reads, He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Imagine the paths of righteousness stretching out before you, way out into the distance. You cannot see the end, but you know that at the end of the journey is home, God's house. As you focus a little closer to you, do you see where the path leads? You can see some places clearly, but other parts are totally obstructed by large or dangerous obstacles. Sometimes the path disappears over a ridge. Some parts of the path are easy to walk along, others are difficult. It was just like this as Israel travelled from Egypt to the Promised Land, and it is described the same way in this psalm. Identify from Psalm 23 the locations that David sees the sheep passing through when following the paths of righteousness as they make their way to the house of the Lord. Well, let's go to Psalm 23, and the first one I see is in verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside the still waters. And verse 3, he restores my soul, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. And verse 6, 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But why are these paths called paths of righteousness, or, as it says in the New International Version and the New Revised Standard Version, right paths? Here are four important reasons. First, they are the right paths because they lead to the right destination, the shepherd's home. Second, they are the right paths because they keep us in harmony with the right person, the shepherd himself. Third, they are the right paths because they train us to be the right people, like the shepherd. Fourth, they are the right paths because they give us the right witness. As we become the right people, we give glory to the Lord. They are right or righteous paths, whether the going is easy or hard. It is important to realise that when God leads us, it is not simply a question of His delivering a parcel to the destination. It is much more than guidance and protection. Like the many examples all through the Bible in which God is leading His people, whether it is leading Abraham by His promises, or leading Israel by the pillar of fire and cloud, when God is guiding, it is always about His training His people in righteousness. And so to finish the day, how conscious are you that righteousness is the shepherd's priority for your life? How can trials change your life so that you better reflect the character of Christ? Tuesday, June 28, Unexpected Detour 1, The Valley Psalm 23 verse 4 reads, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It would be nice if the paths of righteousness wound their way only along the grass-covered banks of cool streams. But that's not the way David paints it. Also along these paths is the valley of the shadow of death, not a place that we are eager to visit. At certain times of the year, the wadis and ravines found in Israel are prone to flash floods that can come unexpectedly and prove overwhelming. These places also are characteristically narrow, with steep sides that block out the light. Hence, the shadow of death is an image for very deep shadow or deep darkness. Think about the times you have been in your own valley of the shadow of death. What has it been like? Did you have fear, even though you knew that the shepherd was there? Which Bible texts were most precious to you at that time, and why? How do you think the sheep ended up in the valley? Do you think the sheep went there on their own, or did the shepherd lead the sheep that way himself? justify your answer. Elizabeth Elliot writes in Quest for Love, page 219, a lamb who found himself in the valley of the shadow of death might conclude that he had been falsely led. It was needful for him to traverse that darkness in order to learn not to fear. The shepherd is still with him. End of quote. And so to finish today, have you ever felt that you have been falsely led into the valley? How did you respond to God during this time? Why do you think the shepherd might be willing to risk being misunderstood by permitting us to enter a dark valley? Wednesday, June 29, Unexpected Detour 2, The Surrounded Table Psalm 23 verse 5 reads, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. 
Throughout our lives, we will inevitably bump into some enemies. How do you deal with them? Have you ever lain awake at night, tossing and turning, dreaming up ways to take revenge on those who are trying to hurt you or destroy your work? It can be hard for Christians to know how to handle enemies. What types of enemies have you had in your life? How have you responded to those who have tried to hurt you or those you care for? How well did you follow Christ's words to us in Matthew 5.44 or Paul's in Romans 12.18-21? Well, we better find out about those, Matthew 5.44. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you, and persecute you. And Romans 12, 18 to 21, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In Psalm 23 verse 5, which read, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over, David shows us an interesting way of dealing with enemies. He obscures their presence by looking instead at what God is doing in his behalf. And God is there preparing a banquet for him. In David's culture, when an honoured guest came for a feast, the host would anoint his head with oil as the guest was about to enter the banqueting hall. The oil was a mixture of olive oil and perfume. Then the guest would be seated in front of far more food than one could ever eat. How could the three items, table, oil, cup, in Psalm 23 verse 5, help to remind us about how God provides, even when we are in the valley? As Paul reminds us, our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, as it says in Ephesians 6.12. Our enemies include those we see and those we don't. Whether we like it or not, we are surrounded. Yet, when we are with the shepherd, not one enemy, visible or invisible, can steal what he has provided for us. And so to finish today, reflect on how the shepherd has treated you when you have been surrounded by enemies. What can you see in these times that can enable you to give thanks even during such difficulties. Thursday, June 30. A Certain Promise for the Journey Psalm 23 verse 6 reads, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we are in the valley or surrounded by enemies, it is sometimes tempting to believe that we have been left alone. It does not always feel as though God has been doing much. We reason that if he had been helping, we wouldn't be in this situation to begin with. But David obviously does not see it like this. In spite of his trials, what two things does David say in Psalm 23, 6 that he is certain of? Let's read that. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We'll compare that with Ephesians 1, verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And Second Peter 1, verse 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, 
for if you do these things you will never stumble. And Hebrews 11, 13-15 These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. Some translations say that goodness and unfailing love, God's covenantal commitment, will follow me all the days of my life. However, the original verb is much stronger, and the text should read that goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. In fact, it's the same Hebrew verb used in such verses as Genesis 14, verse 14. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And Joshua chapter 10, verse 19. And do not stay there yourselves, but pursue your enemies and attack their rear guard. Do not allow them to enter their cities, for the Lord your God has delivered them into your hand. And 1 Samuel 25 and verse 29. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God, and the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the pocket of a sling. In these verses, the idea of pursuit is very clear. What picture do you get in your mind when you imagine goodness and unfailing love pursuing you? What do you think David meant to tell us about God by describing his care for us this way? No matter how deep the valley or how persistent the enemies, the certainty of God's goodness and unfailing love and the certainty of his guidance to the very end of our journey is unquestionable. If these thoughts could sustain Jesus through Calvary, we should take heart as well. There are times, however, when those we care for are full of questions. Like David, the best way to address these concerns is often not with a theological description of what God can do. Rather, as David shows us in Psalm 23 verse 6 when he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, it is through an affirmation, the sharing of a personal conviction of the truth about God. And so to finish today, what evidence is there from your own knowledge of God that can illustrate the certainty that His goodness and unfailing love pursue us? What evidence could you add from the Bible? How could you share this with those who may be questioning the certainty of God's care? How is the cross the greatest example of that pursuit? Friday, July 1. Those who are finally victorious will have seasons of terrible perplexity and trial in their religious life, Ellen White writes in Messages to Young People, pages 63 and 64. But they must not cast away their confidence, for this is a part of their discipline in the school of Christ, and it is essential in order that all dross may be purged away. The servant of God must endure with fortitude the attacks of the enemy, his grievous taunts, and must overcome the obstacles which Satan will place in his way. But if you keep looking up, not down at your difficulties, you will not faint in the way. You will soon see Jesus reaching his hand to help you, and you will only have to give him your hand in simple confidence and let him lead you. As you become trustful, you will become hopeful. You will find help in Christ to form a strong, symmetrical, beautiful character. Satan cannot make of none effect the light shining forth from such a character. 
God has given us his best gift, even his only begotten Son, to uplift, ennoble, and fit us by putting on us his own perfection of character for a home in his kingdom. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, to what extent have you been aware that the terrible perplexity and trial that comes into your life may actually be part of your discipline in the school of Christ? Two, how might our help comfort and encouragement to those in the valley be part of the shepherd's way of getting people through their crises? What things can you as a church do to be better used by the Lord to help those in need? 3. In class, go around and have each person talk about how goodness and mercy pursued them. What can you learn from one another's experiences? And 4. Think about the last hours of Christ's life as he entered into the crucible. From what you can tell, either from the Bible or Ellen G. White in The Desire of Ages, which is a great source, how was Jesus, in his humanity, able to endure? What can we take from his example for ourselves in whatever crucibles we face as well? Inside Story Over the next few weeks, our Inside Story will go from week to week as a serial. To read it is my niece, Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Possessed at Eleven, Part One by Andrew McChesney Sweat poured down 11-year-old Eduardo's face as he raced his skateboard back and forth on the street outside his house on a hot summer morning. Eduardo Ferrier de Santos, his mother called, come in and take a shower before lunch. Perspiring and panting, Eduardo headed straight for the kitchen, forgetting the shower and thinking only about lunch. Eduardo ignored a stranger seated in the living room, waiting for her nails to be painted. His mother ran her own home business, a beauty salon offering manicures and haircuts. Before Eduardo reached the kitchen, he was stopped by his 12-year-old sister. Sit down and catch your breath, she said. Eduardo obediently plumped himself down on a chair. Immediately an unholy shriek escaped his lips. His body began to convulse. His mother rushed to him. A low, distorted voice spoke from Eduardo's mouth, telling his mother to hand over her son or watch him die. Eduardo's mother began to cry. Don't worry, the stranger told Eduardo's mother. Your son has been chosen to be a part of our group. I am a Kendoble leader. Eduardo's mother had heard about Kendoble, a religion that arrived in Brazil on slave ships from Africa in the early 19th century. Kendoble teaches that people can be possessed by the spirits of gods. The spirits, however, aren't gods but fallen angels. Eduardo had been possessed by one of them, an evil spirit from a legion that surrounded the stranger. After some time, the evil spirit left and Eduardo returned to normal. He didn't remember the incident, but his mother couldn't forget, and she took him to the Candoble temple. The temple priests welcomed Eduardo, like a king. What an honour, one said. You have been hand-picked, said another. Only eleven, Eduardo was introduced to spiritism and devil worship. Over the next seven years, he spent much time at the temple, learning to be a priest. Evil spirits spoke to him and through him, The most important lesson they said was never to leave a job undone. If he started a task, he had to finish it. As an adult, Eduardo became high priest of a temple. He earned money from people who wanted him to curse their enemies. But the evil spirits forbade him from cursing Seventh-day Adventists and other Protestant Christians. They are protected, the spirit said, adding that any attempt to curse them would cause Eduardo to lose his powers. The spirits also banned Eduardo from communicating with Adventists and other Protestants. Eduardo found a common law wife, Sedillian Silva de Oliveira, and they had a son, Eduardo Jr. Life was peaceful until Jr. said he wanted to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.